most of you know if you've been attending here um, for a long term as well. So I've grown up in this church. I've spent probably 75% of my Sabbaths for the past 20 plus years, um, Sabbath mornings here between these four walls. Um, and when Ryan asked me to share, I started thinking about my childhood experience in this church. And um, as I was thinking, a few things stood out to me from my, from my experience of going to this church. One was that as, as a child, and still today, I'm a rather shy person. Those who know me well know that I'm, I'm still kind of shy. I'm not super confident all the time when I'm starting conversations with people I don't know, um, or making phone calls, and things of that nature. So I remember coming to church and sometimes being a little bit nervous and intimidated about, about coming because there's a lot of people who I didn't really have close bonds with. And the second thing that I was remembering was that I was also a little self-conscious and I didn't really listen to the sermons that well. Um, I, was, I was trying to remember, I was like, were there any sermons that stood out in my mind from when I was, from when I was a child coming to church? And I... I just remember during sermon time, I would get out my drawing, I would get out my books, or I would um, have my mom or my grandma massaging my neck and I would go to sleep. And it was a really nice experience. I was a fairly calm child, so I didn't mind sitting there and you know doing quiet activities. But I didn't really listen to the sermons. And I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a, a fairly common experience with you know children under a certain age. There was a certain age that I did start listening more to the sermons. You know, more into my past 12 years old, I probably started listening to at least half of the half of the sermon, um, as it had my attention for a little bit. Um, but as we transition into adulthood. I think we sometimes forget how it used to be for us when we were kids in church. I hadn't thought about those memories for, for a long time until this week. I was like, oh yeah, that's how it was how it was when I would go to church. I was, you know, sometimes a little shy, I didn't always listen to the sermon. Um, I think it's really important to remember how it feels to be in the shoes of, of kids of the children who are coming here and meeting with us um, on a weekly basis, or the children who are coming to Pathfinders. From when we're really young, we receive all our information through our senses, and, and that's an important part of development, that we, we learn to, to see things when we're, we're crawling around, learning how to crawl. We see things and reach out for them and touch them, and we put things in our mouths, and, and we're all really oriented with what we can see and touch, and, and s hear, and smell, and taste. And you know, that's how we develop from very young. So when we come to church, when we come to Pathfinders, or when we go to, when we go to a Christian school, and an adult starts telling us about a Jesus, a God, who is invisible, there's, there's often a bit of a disconnect. Because we're used to things that we can touch and see. And we're hearing about a God who is invisible. We're hearing about Jesus can be your friend, but the friends who are sitting right next to us are so much more real. Um, and so I was, as I was thinking about this, I was pondering in my mind, if kids can't see God because he's invisible, how do they get that first picture of who God is? And we often say that it's through our parents, which is kind of the, the, first, um, the first way that we start interpreting who God is, is through our parents. Um, through our mom and dad, their character kind of reflects, um, we associate that with who God is, what God is like in his character. But on an even more practical level for us as a church body, we give, we give children a picture of who God is by how we interact with them. Um, on this, at this church, in this church building, where followers of Christ come to worship, we are giving kids an impression of who Christ is by how we act, by how we interact with them. So children can't see God but they see us every week. Children maybe don't always listen to the sermon, but we are the sermon by how we interact with them. 
And I asked myself some tough questions this week, and they were tough because I felt that they were personally rebuking to me because I had to answer no to a lot of them. So the children that are part of our church here, do they know us? Do we know them? Is church a happy place where people talk to them and encourage them? And then on a kind of deeper level, is our passion for Christ, is our love for Christ so tangible, and is our walk with God so sincere that that's visible to the kids and that's something that they will remember for years to come. And is this place a place that they will want to come not just when their parents bring them but when they're 18 and 29 and 40? Is this a place where they felt the love of Jesus in a genuine way through each one of us sitting here? And I I think we sometimes tend to put that responsibility on maybe the Sabbath school teacher, the Pathfinder leaders, or or the school teachers. But it's a responsibility that falls upon each person who comes here to worship on Sabbath. Each child who enters the doors we have been entrusted with. And they each have a light, um, kind of like their special music talked about. They each have a light, a flame for God, for Jesus. And that can be so easily snuffed out by either you know the attractions of the world or even by our influence. If we are not being friendly to them when they come to church, if we are ignoring them, um, if we're just unappreciative when they do something to help out in church, if we're not passionate in our relationship with God, that can also quench that flame and make them not feel like that's something that they want in their life. I had forgotten what it was like to be a kid coming to church, and I'd forgotten that I'm equally responsible for the picture that they receive of who Jesus, Jesus Christ is. We forget that we are the sermon that kids will remember. So my smile, my interest in them, my words of encouragement after they've done something or made an effort, and my spiritual sincerity All of those things are the sermon that they will remember. And hopefully that's a good sermon that they remember versus them remembering a frown or a negative word or a word of discouragement or hypocrisy in any one of us. The world offers so many attractions. There's so much vying for attention of adults and children. And... Children will be drawn away. They'll slip away. They'll slip through our fingers if we're not doing something to counteract those influences as well. And I think the, the, strongest, the strongest efforts that we can make come with trying to establish positive relationships with the kids that are in our church and in our lives. Establishing positive relationships with them and then allowing them to see something real here. Something that is powerful. Like the power of a change to life. Like the power of someone who is transformed by God's grace working in them. If we have living testimonies that show forth in joy and peace and the fruits of the Spirit in our life, kids may just remember that sermon. As we, as we continue striving to reach children for Jesus Christ, may we remember that it's not always so much the words, it's not always so much um, maybe the, the, the classes and everything, but the impression that we leave by the type of people we are and how willing we are to talk to them and invest time in them and show them Jesus' love in a genuine way. So let's encourage the lights of those children to burn brightly. Let's not discourage them. And let's um, always show them God. Because we are that picture of God for them. Um, Let's always let them know we love them. And we are going to try to do better to be there for them and connect with them.
problem. Problem I need to take care of first. Not I'll tell you what. Hello, Pathfinders. I wanted to thank you for spending this incredible week with me. Did you have a good time? Always remember, Pathfinders, stay forever faithful. Oh, and there's someone I really want you to meet. Here he comes now. Come on, come on. Too big, too small, too flat. Ah, perfect. Pathfinders, I'm pleased to introduce David. What? David, these are the Pathfinders. Wow, there are so many of you. <laughs> well, they're all yours now, David. Pathfinders, it's been an honor. Wow, this is exciting. I have so much to tell you. I, I guess it all started when... Oh, <laughs> right. My story will have to wait. I have a big problem. A giant problem I need to take care of first. Tell you what, meet me here in 2019 and I'll tell you the whole story. In the meantime, remember, just like God has chosen me, He's chosen you. I'll see you at the next Camporee! We're planning on being there at the Camp Rhea in 2019 in August. Um, we have, have a lot of uh, tickets already bought in for the kids and hopefully that we'll have enough kids to match the tickets this time. Um, yeah, we, we try to buy them ahead of time so that way we know that we are going to be going for sure and we're committed to be going there. It's a wonderful opportunity for every child to be able to go there. They learn so much. They interact with uh, so many different peoples. This last time in 2014 we hosted a Australian group. Our school is still dealing with uh, those Australian group. Uh, they're doing activities together I understand, uh, coordinating some type of classes and stuff. So they're active. Friendships have been made uh, over a long distance and we're also planning on having them again here in 2019 to continue that friendship and stuff so keep us in mind in 2019 that is what our uh, goal and our adventure is but I want to bring your thoughts back to last week last week we had a wonderful sermon that Pastor John gave to us he was talking to us about gold which represented God the dove that represented Christ and the oil that represented the Holy Spirit. The Pathfinders are going to read and act out some of your sermon today. Please remember what you heard last week and what you see and hear this week. This may be short and simple, but it has a powerful meaning for all of us right here and right now. Jesus had left the temple and was now seated on the Mount of Olives when dis the disciples came to him asking, What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so Jesus had told them signs to what was to come. But the exact day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the, th the Son, but only the Father. Jesus continues by giving parables of how we should be prepared and living in expectancy of his return, since he will be coming at an hour when we do not expect him. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. 
But the wise took flasks of oil along with them, also with their lamps. When the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and they fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Well, no. But the wise replied, <laughs> There will not be enough for us and for you. Go and buy some yourselves. Oh. I was just like, dee -dee. <laughs> But while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came. And they cried. Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Our scripture was read today from Matthew chapter 18, verse 9. When the verse is quoted, I used to like to, if possible, to read the verse around it so I knew what was happening and get the context of what it said. So if you would like, if you uh, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 18, and I'm going to read from Matthew 18, 1 to 11. That way we have a better concept of actually what's going on. One day when they were sitting at the marketplace, the disciples were discussing what determines a person's greatness in the kingdom of heaven. And they asked Jesus about it, and he called the mother with a small child over to him. Tenderly taking the little one in his arms, he said, Unless you change and become as trusted and harness, harmless as this little child, you cannot even omit, be omitted to the God's kingdom, much less be considered great. Such innocence comes to adults only by choice. That kind of hit me hard. Such innocence comes to adults only by choice. The person who humbles himself like this child is great in the sight of heaven. Whoever becomes a little child or a new believer in my name, welcome me. Excuse me. Whoever welcomes a little child or a new believer in my name welcomes me. But anyone who causes even one of these to lose their faith in me would be better off to have a large millstone tied around his neck and be thrown into the sea. The word is full of temptation, but the terrible day is coming for those who destroy people's faith in me. You need to deal radically with whatever stands in your way of it being saved, even if it means losing something as valuable as a hand or a foot. It is better to be physically handicapped or less successful in this life than to lose out on the next. 
If, for example, your eyes cause you to sin, be willing to lose your sight, if necessary, rather than to lose out on heaven. If you must make a choice, it better be, it's better to forgo greatness in this life than to be consumed by fire in God's judgment. Don't think that little children are worth nothing.